And now the man of the hour, the man of every hour, uh, our great leader, our great moral leader, as well as our great leader in economics and in politics and in philosophy, Dr. Ron Paul. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Very nice. Uh, Thank you very much. As Lou's uh, leaving the stage, I might mention one thing that uh, I don't have a speech because that, that Tom Woods tricked me today. <laughs> he tricked me and I gave my speech already. That's what you have to always watch those media people. They know how to handle it. So I have to think up a new speech, but I might have a few words to say because uh, I always argue that the uh, crowd makes the speech, you know, and we have, have a good crowd here today, so uh, I might be able to wing it a little bit, but uh, I am so pleased to be here, and uh, I have to be very thankful for all the support, and especially for Lou's very nice introduction and his statement, and uh, of course, Scott, Scott Horton has done a little bit of work on that subject, too. All of you have, and, uh, you know, I, um, I think one has to be cautious about, uh, you know, how big their head gets because I don't think you gain a whole lot from that. And, uh, you know, the uh, people frequently at rallies would come up to me when I was still, still in Congress. And they would say, Ron, you're the best congressman in Washington. And, you know, that's a compliment. And, uh, but I would have to, I'd get a little easy, and I'd say, yeah, but just think the competition isn't all that tough. <laughs> so, so we have to be look at it in the proper perspective. Uh, you, you know, the um, one thing in Washington that, uh, that people often would ask me about Washington is, how come I just never got really frustrated? You know, because I was I was there uh, for uh, six years, seven years. I had three terms, and uh, the uh, then I. That was in the early 80s and, se and late 70s. And uh, there were various personal reasons for that. Uh, I really didn't like the job. I really didn't think I was going there in the first place, you know. And uh, I, I had, was missing medicine, and uh, I still had kids in school and a few things like that. So I just said, you know, I think I'll go back. I gave it a pitch. And, and then uh, I was out, you know, for 12 years and practice, uh, um, practice medicine. Uh, for for that that time, but the uh, the frustration level uh, is is uh, I never I never felt that frustrated because uh, I never had the same goals set as others. You know, the first thing that happens when you get to Washington is the leadership of your party comes, especially there if they're in charge. What committees you want on, and what are you going to give me? <laughs> you know, if we put you on this committee, what can you promise you'll do for this? And uh, I, I listed my my committees and this sort of thing, but that was that was not my goal. I had enough uh, seniority. If you looked at it, the old-fashioned seniority, I had a lot of years. Eventually, you know, I went back in in, in uh, two, 90, 1997 and was there, uh, you know, up until 2013. So I had a lot of a lot of seniority, probably a lot more than the ones that ran the committees. But there was absolutely no desire on my part to get there because I knew what it would take. You'd have to deal with lobbyists, you'd have to deal with leadership, you'd have to vote according to leadership. I often uh, wonder, I would kid some of them, but it was serious on my part. There would be uh, you know, a group of us that would vote together, six or eight or so, pretty, you know, pretty solidly with the Constitution. And one day, one of the members of the groups voted the wrong way. He was voting with uh, you know, the leadership position, and I said, where, what's the matter? We're losing you. How come you're voting this way? He says, I'm in leadership now. <laughs> so he was t directed how to go. But, you know, to be a chairman of a committee, I don't know how many millions I can't keep up. It's not a million dollars you need to raise for the party. It might be 10. It might be 20 million dollars. You'd actually have to talk to lobbyists, you know, and, and uh, get that money. Uh, that, that, to me, I had uh, no desire for. But also... <clears throat> 
I also never had any uh, desire for the confrontation. I, it, my personality, uh, some who do very well and they vote well, uh, but personally, I just didn't enjoy confrontation. I didn't want to get into <clears throat> some battle over uh, who's going to get nominated, uh, you know, for speaker and this sort of thing. And there, there was uh, no, no interest at all for me to do that. Uh, so uh, I, I actually just sort of uh, had had goals of, you know, in a social way, uh, just talking to people and asking them about their kids or something else. I didn't want to get into it because I didn't, I didn't see a victory in that. The victory to me was always thinking about you and getting a message out. I know last time, uh, the first time I was in, a lot of uh, financial newsletters were going out, the gold newsletters because of the, the excitement of gold in the 70s. And I communed that way with a lot of people, but I was always thinking of another audience and, uh, and realized that the audience was in, 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 in Washington. And uh, the other, one other thing that I came to a conclusion to on, uh, on this was the, the two-party system. And my topic, uh, sort of, today is uh, t two parties. <laughs> Does it really, who really cares? Doesn't make a difference. And a lot of people, people outside of Washington, uh, would, uh, would come up to me, and media people would come up when the third party idea came up. And they said, well, uh, do you think we should have a third party? And I said, yeah, I think, I, matter of fact, though, but I think we have to get a second party first. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I am a member of two parties, even though I'm not a very party person. Uh, I don't belong to the Democrat Party, but I do belong to the Republican Party, technically speaking, and uh, to the Libertarian Party. And when I joined the Libertarian Party, I joined as a lifetime member, and I paid, with, uh, paid my membership with one ounce of gold. <laughs> <laughs> But the party, the parties are very secondary, and I would get into trouble with the Republican Party when I thought I indicated the party is very secondary. It's a vehicle. It's the way you do things, but uh, they're not very philosophic. Uh, either either party, even though that's a, a lot of what uh, what they make of, of the noise that they talk about. But uh, I, I, I thought it was better uh, not to be in a confrontation with people. It was more that part. I sort of separated in my mind. That was a social thing. And the other part was I wasn't much interested in it because I never wanted to get into a fight that the results had no meaning. And that's about what goes on up there, long term, you know, uh, just which party's in charge and who head of the committee. It, it really uh, didn't, didn't make a lot, lot of difference. You know, in, in 2012, uh, we, we, there was a convention, and we were doing very well, but we uh, didn't get all our votes counted. They slipped through the crack someplace. So the, our votes weren't counted, but we had our own, con we, we had our own convention. I think we had probably as many, maybe more than that were at the other convention, and uh, there was a lot of excitement. Of course, uh, I remember giving my probably very typical speech at the time, and a uh, typical political speech would be uh, uh, 45 minutes or an hour. I'm not going to go that long today. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, it would it would be, uh, and I think that day it was an hour and 15 minutes because there was a lot of excitement, a lot of people, and somebody from the media came up to me and they said, "You've talked for an hour and 15 minutes, and you never once mentioned the opposition, o o Obama or Mitt Romney," and I said, "Who are they?" <laughs> To me, to me, I didn't do it deliberately. I wouldn't do that. I'm a nice person. So I, I, <laughs> I excluded them because they didn't seem to be that important, you know. And, uh, and, but, the, but they said that you never mention, mention their name, but concentrating on what I thought was important in a scheme of things long term, uh, I think uh, it'll turn out that uh, they're fairly irrelevant. And I think, the, I think people like you who think and have ideas, people who support the Mises Institute and these other, uh, other groups, I, I think that's, that's what has real value, and that is where I can get energized in, in, uh, and, and not, uh, 
and, and not expect a political fight there. So I wasn't kind of out for politics. I didn't like those kind of fights. I, I, I never th thought that I was, uh, could be successful. So I was always surprised how well we, how well we did. But, uh, you know, you know, I tend to think that people shouldn't be arrogant and boastful and that people should, uh, think that a little bit of humbleness doesn't hurt you. And uh, at times, uh, I learned that in campaigning. I don't know if my wife has arrived here today, but she might be. Yeah, I hear her. She is in the back there. She snuck in. <laughs> <clears throat> But uh, she, would, she would do a lot to humble me, not by lecturing me, but just getting recognition, you know. But what, I remember one time, and we were in our, uh, in our district here, and uh, we were leaving a restaurant, and I was in the car driving, and she was sitting next to me. And I see a, a lady coming out of the restaurant and running over toward the car. So I rolled my window down. She didn't even stop. She went immediately over to the other side. She wanted to talk to my wife. But boy, I lectured her after that. There's a limit to how much of this you can do, you know. I'm the congressman. <laughs> but, uh, you, you know, she was pretty important in all of that uh, because, uh, you know, in 1997, 96 and 7, you know, that was the campaign I had been on for 12 years. And uh, the Republicans weren't anxious to have me back. I couldn't understand it because, because I'm a nice guy, you know, and I never fought with them. But boy, they didn't want me back. Yeah. So uh, I went to the, uh, the group of, uh, of Republicans by that time. When I first went to Washington, there were three Republicans in all of Texas. And at this time, there were about 15, you know. So the Republican Party was growing. So I went and had a meeting with this group. And that was when DeLay and, Ra uh, and Army were in charge of the Texas delegation. So I, it was a courtesy call. You know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. There was a Democrat in the seat. And uh, I usually didn't fight over, uh, uh, you know, leadership positions. I said they, they, they shouldn't expect that. And I would uh, give the Republican a vote on leadership. So uh, I went in there thinking, well, I can sell them this. Look, I think I can beat this Democrat you had in there. I think we can make this a Republican seat. And uh, I'm thinking about running. But, you know, uh, I was shocked after I decided that I was going to run. The, dis the seat changed a lot sooner than I realized. I went and bribed the guy to switch over to become a Republican. <laughs> And they gave them everything. So uh, to, to my surprise, everybody else, because I didn't think I could overcome that because Newt Gingrich came to campaign against me. Both Bushes campaigned against me. Both senators campaigned against me. And uh, I think the House of Representatives had about 65 House of Representatives donate some of their campaign money, you know, to, uh, to beat me on this. So I thought... Well, I was sort of, uh, you know, stoic about the whole thing. You know, let it be what has to be. But uh, then, then we, uh, we we did accomplish that, and and we uh, we won that seat. But but uh, it was um, it was something that uh, probably was a, a big surprise to them and, and to me. Uh, but. Uh, uh, it, it also says something, because the whole issue was I had been a libertarian in 1988, and one of my issues, because even then, that I thought was so ruthless, uh, was the war on drugs. And I took this very strong position uh, of abolishing the war on drugs. And... Uh, <laughs> So when, uh, when I announced, I had uh, talked to friends, I said, you know, you know what they're going to hit me on? Uh, it's it's going to be the war on drugs, you know. So the Republican, then I had to have a pro Republican primary race. And uh, the establishment, the NRCC put in the money and did so many other things. And uh, they put the, some of the worst ads up against me. Ugly, mean, nasty stuff about what, how, how these how these drugs are hurting babies. And uh, we counteracted that by me delivering a baby and holding a newborn. And nobody believed their <laughs> demagoguing about what harm I was going to do to these kids. But they spent a million dollars and they didn't win. And you'd think that would, uh, th that would tell the Democrats, uh, then I had to run against a Democrat. But they said, Nobody can be against the war on drugs in the 1990s. Maybe today they can. But back then, nobody was a 
opposed to it. They all opposed it, you know, and they would tell me that. We'd have token votes in Washington. They said, we know you're right, but, oh, I couldn't handle How would I explain this, this to my district? So, uh, I, th th so the Demo Democrats spent the million dollars, too, and it didn't do them any good. And it was still a strong, pretty strong Democratic uh, uh, district in, in many ways. But uh, it, it, is, uh, it is something that uh, people, you just don't know. And I came out of that with the conclusion that uh, a lot more people uh, had been damaged, families damaged by, by the drug laws. That was back when it was not unheard of to take teenagers and put them in prison with hardened criminals and just make real criminals out of them. And uh, I think all you'd have to do is have one, one individual treated that way and how many family members and neighbors would understand the stupidity of the whole thing. So I, I think that was lying there, but nobody, nobody ever talked about it. But I have to give Carol a little bit credit for this too because uh, uh, she she really worked on the assumption she didn't know too much about this uh, political stuff. Uh, she was interested in raising kids and uh, and Girl Scouts and all those things. And uh, so she uh, she says, you know, with all these horrible ads out there about how horrible person you are, we have to do something about it. And I said, what are we going to do? So she says, well, you know, I think we should do a family cookbook. I said, family cookbook? <laughs> Who wants to care about our family cooking our recipe? <laughs> because some of them they had too much fat in them or something. <laughs> so she said, no, no, we should, we should, we should do that. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, she, 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 she put this together. And uh, I said, no, nobody, nobody wants this. They, they want to hear me talking about the Federal Reserve. <laughs> And the exchange stabilization fund. Uh, but anyway, I caved in pretty easily. I uh, said, so go ahead, do it. But th there was really nothing political about it, except that it was shrewd politics. So she took pictures uh, of our kids, and some were married, some weren't, and little ones and big ones, and she'd take pictures of each one and put the kids together and have a little note about each one of them. Now, they're strangers. What do they care about our family? <laughs> and uh, so I make, made fun of it a bit. And I made fun of this, you know, at Republican rallies afterwards. I said, I did it. And I said, we went along with it. And I said, I have to admit, it turned out to be the best political, <laughs> political outreach, or political advertisement we ever did. People loved it. And it makes a point, though, that even in spite of how important philosophy is, and I put it way up here, you know, non-confrontation and getting along with people and being friends with people uh, go a long way, too because most people don't pay much attention. And uh, that's why a personal approach, if you're involved in politics, is pretty important. And uh, it, it turned out that that had a lot to do with changing, changing the attitudes, because after what she described how wonderful our family was, and we do have a wonderful family, they said, this guy can't be a drug dealer. <laughs> So we, we took we took care of that. <laughs> so um, you you know the um, uh, issue during the campaign was whether or not uh, we should have a strong president, and we don't want a weak president. A strong president is one that knows how to fight wars, and a strong president sometimes gets credit if they even start the wars, because sometimes people say, you have to be a wartime president, and I think there was a Bush that claimed that one time, I need a war to be a wartime president, which is pretty bad as far as m bad morality, I think. So uh, the, they, uh, the, the strong president is usually designed with militarism, law and order, crack down, control people, and, and all that. Some people think if you're strong, you take away the guns from the people and you give it to the bureaucrats. It's all kind of a mixed bag of a strong president. But I think that uh, there's a different type of strength, and I think that's what we see in the philosophic group. The strength, uh, you know, I had met Murray and Mises and uh, Sandholtz and the, uh, Hazlitt, all these people, and they were strong people of character. You know, and to me, that's where I thought the strength came from, uh, not in this political demagoguing, and we, uh, we hear that.
So resisting, you know, this temptation and pressure, resisting the deep state that, you know, gets the organization there to put pressure on the politician, like in the drug war. They did admit the drug wars were bad, but they were convinced that uh, it would hurt their political career and they had to do it. So uh, I think uh, of strength in politics as the, as the uh, willingness to, to stand for what you believe in and not be intimidated. And it's not a, vi it's not a violent uh, it, you, you know, confrontation. It's just a philosophic strength. And that's distinguished from that of the people who are militant and think that the thing of uh, the greatness of American American exceptionalism is our willingness to spread our goodness around the world and uh, and have the people accept our way. Well, I don't happen to accept that. I think that's a terrible thing to do. And I believe that America is a great country, has been, has some great ideals, but. If they're worth anything, we as a people should be practicing those qualities and people should want to emulate us. And then I think we could spread the goodness of American rather than thinking you spread it with guns and killing and wars. You know, I want to just mention a few things that uh, does motivate me, uh, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier when uh, Tom was quizzing me about what my speech was all about. <laughs> uh, the the uh, is the, the thing that I really find as a great selling point about uh, about liberty is that it's not divisive and it brings people together. You say, what do you mean? <clears throat> yeah. You, you know, how can you bring these uh, uh, far, far leftists? Well, some, you can't do it, but some conservatives, you can't do it either. But people with an open mind, uh, you, you can. And there are uh, people from the, the left or whatever you call them, but honest uh, progressives, progressives who believe in civil liberties and believe in a non-confrontational uh, non uh, uh, foreign policy. So you can reach people but what people have to realize that in liberty, uh, the government is out of the way. People get to choose totally and completely how they're going to use their liberty. And the hardest thing to accept is the fact that once you get your liberty, uh, the responsibility is on that individual, on all of us, uh, to do what we think is right, and you can't depend on, on, on the government. So if you want to use your liberty to do dumb things, what if, what if you... Uh, uh, aren't very good at uh, not reliable working and you waste your money and you gamble and do a lot of dumb things like that. Shouldn't the government be there to take care of you? And I say, no, you should suffer the consequences of what should happen if you waste your liberty. And this whole idea that you have to have government there uh, to make us safe and secure, whether it's, it's socially, religious-wise, uh, or uh, economically, uh, th this, uh, this isn't true. People should be allowed to use their liberty any way they want. That means that if in a free country, you know, you can have any religion you want, and you don't have to have one if you don't want. And you say, well, you don't care? Yeah, I care, but I just don't think the government should be involved. And that's a big difference. And uh, if you have... Uh, personal, moral, and religious beliefs, they should be expressed, uh, you know, in your own way, in a voluntary manner, but, you know, not through the government. The government shouldn't be there for that. The government should be there for one thing, and that is the preservation of liberty so that we can make our own decisions about our life, our, our money, and allowing other countries to do the same thing. But uh, you know, the uh, bringing bringing together means that the crowds should be diverse. The more diverse they are, I think, uh, the better. Uh, but the problem the problem really is is that their their diversity that the opposition wants means they want the upper upper hand uh, in in what we do. And I think the best answer for people that uh, talk about this is if the see I believe uh, I believe socialism should be legal. What the heck? There's been socialist type, you know, enclaves, but they should be legal. And, uh, but, but they don't have a right to make you participate in their socialism. <laughs> uh, 
so a good libertarian society should tolerate people who believe in economic uh, 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 economic socialism. We, they should be allowed to do that, but they're not allowed to use force to do this. And that's, of course, uh, if you're a um, so the, the conventional wisdom of socialists is uh, no, we don't want any voluntary capitalism. <laughs> we need your money, and uh, that's that's the whole thing. They want to use force. And, uh, and they have all the guns. We should work much harder at talking about uh, getting rid of guns. I think guns need control. We need to really crack down on the guns that are used to modify our lives. That means I want to eliminate all the guns of all the federal bureaucrats in the whole country. <laughs> So we, we're, we're, for, for, uh, we're for gun controls, but uh, we're for self-reliance, too, and self-defense. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a big difference. And yet today, every year, we have more and more police force. And not only do we have the federal police force, we have the uh, militarization of local police departments now, too. And even our current president brags about, you know, how much weaponry and military weaponry we can, you know, put in. But this was a consequence. And still probably is to a degree of the war on drugs you know you need you need tanks to go after these bad guys and and they have all kinds of uh, of, of equipment and uh, so and that's that's the opposite of a voluntary society uh, so I, I think of volunteerism as a good example of what we should do if we have our freedoms all associations are okay one strong rule is no lying no cheating no stealing and no killing it's not too complicated. You know how long that's been around? Probably about four or 5,000 years <laughs> they've been talking about that. So why aren't we doing better uh, at this? And one thing I think has happened over the years is uh, technologically, think of what has happened in technolog technology, especially the last 200 years, especially in the last 100 years, especially in the last 30 years. And it's moving rapidly and so often who gets control of it or helps design it, and that is the government. You think of, uh, I remember at the end of the Second World War when the jet airplanes came out, and they were talking about, oh, they'll be, and they did, they made jet fighters one of the, the first thing. Uh, you know, the, um, the, the uh, f first wheel was, de uh, was discovered and used probably 30,000 uh, 30, years BC. And uh, it was, the first wheel was a, a potter's instrument to, to, to make pottery. Uh, and uh, the uh, first wheel for movement was used on chariots, military chariots. So it's this, it's this uh, moral attitude that so much is conceded to the government, too much power to the government, and technology is used so much you know, to perpetuate what they're doing. Even, even today, just think how much money goes into the military and all this technology. And right now, uh, you know, I thought the uh, internet was the greatest thing in the world, and I still do. I, I think it's wonderful, but I don't like the part where they're in bed with the government. They just collect information for the government, and that's getting worse. You, you know, this, uh, this super Patriot Act that's coming in, they're going to ac accumulate more and more information ever. And uh, the Attorney General and the President is all for this thing because we have to find out the potential bad people and put them away without trial. You know, that sort of thing. So uh, that, this technology is wonderful but it can be used the wrong way. And for some reason, we have, you know, in spite of this challenge we have from the government, just think of all that has advanced in, uh, in the modern age. Tremendous advancement that we have, even in the last 100 years. I mean, uh, 100 years ago, they were still, uh, you know, horse and buggy days. And so that we do get it in spite of the government. But can you imagine what would happen if we had a government uh, or a lack of government or a minimal government where people made all the decisions and that you had to follow these rules. I, I think it would be a nice place to live, you know, uh, and it would be a safe place to live too, but it wouldn't be perfect. But uh, the imperfections now are magnified because it's the 
government that coerces us into doing things and the collection of the revenues we pay for it. But of course, that is the calamity that we're working toward, and that's why our message is so important. And the calamity is that uh, we have taught people to believe that entitlements are morally proper, that they are entitled thing and they are victims and we have to take care of them. And they think of that as a moral principle as strong as we think of self-reliance and hard work and effort it is a good moral principle. So they, they, uh, uh, they think that uh, this moral principle of entitlement is uh, the, the thing that we must go along with. And I say, no, that has to be reversed. And you can, um, you, you can say, well, wouldn't this make the world a lot poorer and more dangerous? No, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, I think there's all forms of, uh, of, uh, of, of being protection. But what we have done is we've slipped away to a thinking that the government, and I don't know how people could accept it, is omnipotent and they can make us safe and secure. So they will always make us safe from harm and they'll make us secure economic exchange. Well, the economy uh, is on the verge of uh, becoming like Venezuela or worse. So it, it doesn't make us safe and secure. How many policemen do you think you need? John Beza would tell us how many, how many policemen would he have to engage if he wanted to just go into the homes of all the people just in this room to make sure that there was never a harm done to anybody on your property? You'd have to have about six policemen at eight, each household. The whole thing is ridiculous. They, they can't make us safe. So what do we do on the inner city where most of the crime is? That's where the strongest laws are against the guns where they might do something for themselves. Self-reliance. <clears throat> Self-reliance is great. There's a motivation, and people are inclined to do more and more. And then you say, well, what, what is this all about? Can't we just send good people to Washington, and they'll take care of us? And I say, no, you can't do that. It won't work. Uh, but the, one of the reasons, and this is very personal, uh, and other people will have other reasons why we want to live in a free society for economic reasons or, or, or whatever. Uh, but I think ultimately... A free society that I talk about and I envision is something that is very personal. I think our freedoms are very personal. They come to us in uh, a personal way, in a natural way, or a God-given way, and that we're that we're responsible uh, for that. But uh, we. Uh, we, we should then have to deal with our lives, not only of safety, we might not even need the FDA, you know, we could maybe put them out of business and we might even learn better eating habits. <laughs> You know, in the, in the campaigning, one of the examples I used to throw out uh, to the crowd, and I thought it was just, just as a spare of a moment, and nobody would, everybody would think it was silly. I said, you know, in a free society, we are supposed to have a free society, and we're not even allowed to buy raw milk. <laughs> and there was some applause, and as it went on, it was sort of a sort of a joke. But there's a lot of people who believe that things like that, what you can drink and 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 eat. But uh, I think the the goal should be. Uh, uh, for me personally, and uh, suggest for others, is that in a free society, you're more, you, the responsibility falls on us as individuals with the help of family, friends, and neighbors, and churches. And that is that uh, hopefully we can get people to think that, you know, it would really be pretty neat living in a society where everybody's goal is to seek excellence, work for excellence, do the best we can. And I think the rewards, no matter where you are on the scale of IQs or what your abilities are, I, I think the rewards uh, are not that way. Just because somebody has more ability that they have greater rewards. But I think when people work for their excellence and do what they can to take care of themselves, the satisfaction that people have uh, for self-reliance is, uh, is, is not related to the, uh, the size of uh, somebody's pocketbook or anything else or basic intelligence. It's just that it's assuming this uh, responsibility. But I think that uh, the free society offers that or, or and puts pressure on people to uh, seek excellence, but also the seeking virtue. But virtue is something, it's not that easy to define. I think everybody has a pretty good idea about it. And there's a lot of people in Washington assume that you have no virtue. 
You don't behave yourself. You have habits like this, and you do this. So we want you to be more virtuous. So they take over this whole issue of making people virtuous and make them work for excellence and make them prosperous and make them safe. I would say that's all wrong. We should limit it strictly to the role, if we are to have government, the role of government ought to be narrowly limited to the protection of your liberty. I think the founders understood that, and they made that point, and uh, they understood it. I always marvel at reading about the founders uh, when uh, you think about uh, their intelligence and how well-educated they were. You know, they, they, they really were educated, and they didn't even have an internet, you know. <laughs> they, they had books, they read books, and they probably, and, and probably most of them weren't uh, educated in a government school either, but uh, it, it was, uh, they, they were well educated, they knew their history, and they brought together the ideas of liberty that had been around. And uh, of course, Adam said that, we, uh, we've given you a constitution, but the truth is uh, it, it won't work if the people are not moral. And that's back to the virtue and excellence. So in, in an immoral society, and that's our real challenge today is because we see more and more immorality. It might be more challenging to uh, accept my optimism that there's still a lot of people out there about, that care about this and that uh, we can still win this. And I, 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 I really do believe that. And my goal is to take all this wonderful uh, technology that we have and instead, instead of building more or tanks, maybe we need more ambulances and more good medical care coming out of the market. But everything should be voluntary. Every, everything should be peaceful. And uh, I would think that that would be a worthy goal. It's probably uh, uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a, a dream. But believe me, that dream of living in a free society is a lot better than the nightmare that we're facing, and it's going to get a lot worse because we have to resolve all the mistakes made, the, the, uh, the, the financial mistakes. And if people think that modern monetary theory is going to solve the problem, just run the presses faster. And they're in a dilemma right now, and the end stages are coming because even those on Wall Street and in the banks and the Federal Reserve, we have never heard any time in all of history where people had negative interest rates. Figure out what does that mean, you know? Uh, interest rates are key because it tells the price of every transaction and the price of money. But this whole thing that, that the price is down to negative, uh, that's going to be resolved. It's not workable. So that's what we have to prepare for and uh, see it as an opportunity. We may have to be frugal for a while and take care of ourselves, but we'll all survive and we'll all do well if we can live in a free society. Thank you very much.